Uh, well, it's great to be here and uh, we've had a great welcome. Um, so uh, thank you very much for that, Julian. Um, and here we are, we're going to look at the next instalment um, of this short series as we lead up to Easter. And we're looking at Matthew 26 and the Garden uh, of Gethsemane, uh, which culminates in Jesus's arrest. So when we look at it, I don't think we can actually fully appreciate what Jesus has gone through, uh, certainly not this side of heaven anyway. Um, but we'll do the best we can, uh, and our aim is to be able to take something away from this passage that we can uh, use when we go through our own trials and our own troubles. So I'm just going to set the scene, and this gets a bit big, so um, just bear with me for a little bit on this. It's often said um, that if something is repeated in the Bible, then you should take notice of it. Well, the passage on Gethsemane is repeated in Matthew, Mark and Luke, and it is also mentioned in John. Uh, so that's all four Gospels, so you could say that's uh, uh, really important and we need to uh, look at that. Uh, however, you might say, yes, Lyndon, but uh, actually this is culminating in Jesus' arrest, and if he wasn't arrested, um, then Jesus wouldn't have gone to the cross, and without that, there's no gospel. Mm. And without any gospel, there's no good news. So it's obvious that as they are gospels, and they are good news, that this is going to happen. Uh, but it, as well as the gospels all pointing towards this point, these, these few days in history, so the whole Bible points towards this. And just as a demonstration that some people in Storrington may have been bored of by now, um, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I'm going to put my ruler in this point in the Bible. Now the Bible's not chronological exactly, but for the purpose of this demonstration, it's chronological enough. Um, and so this is the point where um, Gethsemane happens and Jesus is crucified. Um, so from this point here, uh, starting with Genesis, all the way up to my ruler, all points forward to Jesus dying on the cross. So everything in this part of the Bible has a, like an arrow pointing this way uh, to my ruler. Uh, and, cons and, and as well on this side, um, everything after Jesus' death all points back to that point where Jesus dies on the cross and shines a light from both directions, if you like, on this one small but massive time in history. Um, this point here where we are now, we're in now, this is the crossing the road um, section, if you like, because you have to look both ways. And if you don't look both ways, you're gonna do something big. So we look back towards the death of Jesus, but we're also looking forwards um, to when he returns and comes again. So there's a short whistle stop tour through uh, the Bible from one side to the other. Um, and now back to Gethsemane, where Jesus and his disciples are in Bethany. Um, which is in the locality of Jerusalem. Uh, all arrived, uh, and the Passover has just begun. And Jesus has just spent the Passover meal with his disciples um, as the Last Supper. Now, it's no uh, coincidence, shall we say, that this is happening now. It's no coincidence that this is the celebration of the Passover uh, because Jesus is going to be the ultimate Passover lamb, the ultimate sacrifice um, for the sin of mankind. But it's a little bit more than that as well because whilst God has used history in order to shine this spotlight onto uh, this point where Jesus dies, 
it's more than that because he's actually orchestrated history in order that this spotlight can be shone upon this point. So I put my ruler back in here. If we take a point here, which uh, just to briefly uh, look at this, where uh, we can look at Joseph. Um, with, uh, just going to have a little uh, look at the time of Joseph because I like Joseph um, because it's nice and easy on that story to see that even though Joseph went through some hard and difficult times, um, you can see all the way through God working throughout um, in an easy way. So Joseph gets his coat from his dad, which has got lots of colours. Um, and in his arrogance, he, he, he uh, parades around in it. His brothers get very angry with him and they don't like his arrogance. So they take him along and they throw him into a pit uh, to kill him. Uh, fortunately, um, some slave traders come in past. And so um, his brothers sell Joseph to the slave traders. <clears throat> the slave traders take him to Egypt and in Egypt, uh, he's sold um, as a slave and eventually through lots of contorted things he gets thrown into prison and in a way that only you that only God can do if you like he uh, and when you read the story you can see that God is pointing and directing at every part um, he goes from prisoner to prime minister. There's a famine in the land. Uh, Egypt, because of Joseph, does well. Um, the, the Israelites don't. So the Israelites are able to then come to Egypt uh, because of Joseph. And he saves his people from starvation uh, because of the famine in the land. Um, the Israelites come, they prosper. The Egyptians think, oh no, we can't have this. And so they then enslave them uh, and the Israelites get enslaved. The Israelites decide they uh, want to go home. God decides that he wants the Israelites to go home. Uh, and Moses is tasked for this job, but Pharaoh says no. And we know the story where the plagues then come, and this plague, the plagues then culminate into the last one, uh, which is the death of the firstborn, where the angel of death is going to come along, and the firstborn of every household will be taken. So God says to Moses, he says, tell the people to take a lamb, to sacrifice it, take the blood and paint it on the doorposts and along the lintel. And this will be a sign. And the angel of death, when he comes along, he will see that sign. He will not go in through those doors. He will pass over the house uh, and go on his way. The lamb dies in the place of the firstborn. The blood of the lamb on the doorposts and the lintel is a sign that the lamb has died for the firstborn in that house. All of that in this part, God says, remember this, remember this. And he doesn't say remember this in order to have a, a yearly party, if you like, but he says remember this in order so that when the time comes for my son to come, you will know that it is him that has come and you will know why he's coming and you will understand what it is that's happening. Because Jesus is to be the ultimate sacrificial lamb. John the Baptist said, behold the son of God um, so we behold the Lamb of God that has come to take away the sin of the world. So Jesus 
was the first, uh, so Jesus came and his sole purpose was so that he could die as the ultimate sacrificial lamb. Okay, so that's some of the, um, uh, the setup, if you like. So at this point, we zoom back to Gethsemane and this is the point which is uh, where if it was in the films, you have the big red button in front of you, uh, which says underneath it, launch sequence. And as Jesus goes into the garden of Gethsemane, he's got his hand above the button. And that is the point uh, where we are in history. Um, and that is what uh, Jesus has uh, in his mind in the garden. So I'm going to just read from verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Uh, now in, in Luke's gospel, uh, it says the words as usual. Uh, so from that, we can take that it is somewhere where the disciples and Jesus went regularly. So they knew this place. It was a nice place. It, it, would, it, it was a place where they could withdraw from other people, be on their own with God. Jesus could be on his own with the Father and he could have communion with him. And uh, it would be a nice, a, would have been a pleasant setting in amongst the olive trees. It's probably worth mentioning as well um, that we have two contrasting gardens here. So at this, at this end of the Bible, at the beginning, uh, we have the Garden of Eden. And just before Marula is the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Eden, Adam went against the will of God. And by going against the will of God, he let sin into the world. At this end, with the Garden of Gethsemane, we have Jesus, who is also referred to as the second Adam. And in this garden, as we've read already, he does the will of God. And his, he, he, he falls in line with the will of God. And the result of that and going, uh, is that he goes to the cross and he breaks the bond of sin. And gives us the opportunity to uh, break those shackles from ourselves. And Jesus in that garden was victorious, whereas, Jesus, uh, whereas Adam in the first garden uh, failed. But this victory that Jesus has given us was not easy. And we see that Jesus was in great distress. And verse 37 and 38 say that he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He then said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Uh, the Gospel of Mark records that Jesus was in agony and his sweat became like great drops of blood. And this is a a graphic description of suffering to a point that is unimaginable. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus walks further into the garden and he falls to the ground. Jesus was fully aware of what was going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him. He was fully aware of this because, and we know that because he told the disciples, he told them that his time uh, was near. 
He was fully aware of how he was going to be treated. He was fully aware of how he was killed. And he was fully aware of the physical pain that he was going to endure. And if that wasn't enough, he was also fully aware that he was going to experience the wrath of God and his anger. He was going to experience a separation from his father, something that had never happened. He was going to experience punishment from his father for our sin. This was the cup. The sorrow that he was going to experience this from his father, who he loved. And that the father would inflict this punishment on his one and only son, who he loved and in him was well pleased. Jesus prays, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Another version is in Luke, it says, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup from me. You know the words, I know how you feel. They can only really be helpful or a comfort to us if they come from somebody who knows how you feel. And if that person doesn't know how you feel, those words are empty uh, and meaningless. However, when we look at this passage, we can realise that Jesus really, really knows how we feel. Whatever kind of distress and anxiety we have, whatever position or we find ourselves in, however um, we feel or when we think that things are too hard, Jesus really does know and understand how we feel. When our friends don't understand, Jesus does understand. And we never need to be alone in our distress. Jesus returns to his disciples and they're asleep. Jesus says, couldn't you keep watch for just one hour? And as a young Christian, I thought, yeah, that's not a lot to ask. Why couldn't you have just kept on for one hour? That's not a lot to ask. After all, this is Jesus we are talking about. They do say that when you point the finger at some, there's three fingers pointing back at yourself. So when I fell asleep in my prayers and woke up, I knew there was a voice in my head saying, couldn't you just stay awake for 10 minutes? After all, it is Jesus I was talking to. I wish that had only happened once. I hope I'm not the only person here that has fallen asleep in my prayer time. Maybe I am. But we fail in many ways. We fail and fall short and we disappoint Jesus so often that we deserve this rebuke. But that isn't what Jesus is doing here. His response is not... Uh, a punishment or a rebuke. And if we read a bit further from verse 40, Jesus says, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this is what we get from Jesus. When we come to him, we sin and we fail and deserve the rebuke, but what we get is compassion and understanding. When we come to him, we get compassion and understanding. Verse 42. He went away for a second time and he prayed, my father, if it is not possible, this cup to be taken away 
unless I drink it. May your will be done. At first glance, it looks like it's a repeat, but it's not. It's different to his first prayer. Uh, and just as an illustration to show the difference between the two, uh, I'm going to add something into the verse, into this second, birth, uh, second prayer here of Jesus, and I'm going to add my name. And if you want, you can add your name um, in your head whilst I, whilst I read it. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away from Linden, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And add your name in there if you agree with that. The first time Jesus pray, prays, he says, everything is possible, please take this cup from me. And we can think, yes, it was possible. The possibility was there, but God would say, you, if you don't drink it, then the cup remains with Lyndon. And I guess I deserve it, because that is my punishment that it is in that cup. But Jesus says, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away from Lyndon, unless I drink it, may your will be done. That is pure and absolute submission to the father, and it's for me. And if you want to put your names next to me, please do that. So Jesus returns to his disciples, he sees that they're sleeping again, and I'm not criticising them because now I can see myself there. And he leaves them to pray again. Luke tells us that in these times where Jesus is praying, that an angel from heaven comes and appears to him and strengthens him. So we see the result of this time that Jesus spends with his father, the result of him submitting to his will. Uh, the, when Jesus returns to his disciples at the end, he has the strength he needs to carry out what is set before him. Jesus returns to his disciples, verse 45, and he says, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. And the exclamation marks are there to show the attitude that Jesus has at this point. Jesus now has the strength in order to fulfill what he has to come. And Jesus, as we know, willingly gives himself up. He doesn't do it weakly. He does it with strength. Over a few weeks back, uh, Julian, Ollie and Michael have done a series on prayer. And we learned how prayer in line with God's will is powerful and effective. Well, Jesus here gives us the perfect example of how to come to the Father in prayer for it to be powerful and effective and for him to come away with strength in order to complete his task. So in conclusion, there's a quick four point conclusion that I have for us. Point number one, as we approach Easter, everything in creation shines a spotlight on this point in time where Jesus dies. Everything shines a spotlight to highlight what God has done and what Jesus has done through 
his son. And that it was for me. And it was also because of me. Point two, Jesus really does know how we feel. And when we're in our dark times, we don't need to be alone. We can come to him and he really, really, really knows how we feel. He has been through it before us. Point number three, we fail, we fall short and we disappoint even ourselves, let alone God. And we deserve rebuke for that. We, we deserve punishment for that. But when we come to God, we just get compassion and understanding. And the fourth point, prayer is powerful and effective. And as you've seen in this account, God may or may not take away what is troubling us. We may still have to go through it. He may take it away. We may have to go through it. But if we have to go through it within God's will, he will provide us with the strength to do it. And so I'm just going to finish on the... Um, with the same quote, uh, the same uh, verses that Mark finished on uh, last week, which is Hebrews 4 uh, and verse 14 and to, uh, 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy great to help us in our time of need. Amen. Amen. Amen.